Hey gang, welcome back. Here's one you don't see every day. This is sort of a hot rodded guitar, pride and joy of Hamilton's own Ginger St. James, who's a, a honky tonk superstar here in town. And uh, it's ailing, it's got some issues. I think this started life as a 1950s K arch top. See, it's got a P90 in it there. But it was customized, uh, hot rodded by Garage Land Custom Instruments. Um, I don't think he's under that name anymore. He's a guy in Toronto who does this kind of thing. Does sort of a retro styling kind of thing. And uh, it's pretty. It's got sort of a, I don't know how you would describe that color, but it's sparkly. Now, at some point, this thing required a bit of neck work on it. And she took it to another guy and I happen to know the guy. I mean, I don't know him well. I've met him before. And I'm not going to disparage him too much because I sort of know the backstory behind it. But basically, I'm going to be repairing a repair. Um, he ended up with some serious health problems and was unable to work. And um, eventually, this got handed back to her in this condition. And she said her heart just sort of dropped. And, you know, like I say, I'm not going to be too critical, but... You know, I get a lot of questions from would-be guitar repair people, and my main thing is you have to sort of develop an eye to being self-critical. And there are things going on in this guitar, like, I don't know if you can see that there, this sort of fuzzy, weird tape. It's right down, you know, you'll see it as soon as you pick the guitar up. That can't leave the shop like that. It's just, it's wrong, you know. Looking at the heel here, you can see it's befallen some calamity. There's a crack that runs all the way through probably happened during the neck reset. Some of you will recall that Gibson I did a couple of months back where something similar happened. It does happen, you know. If there, sometimes there can be a latent check in the end grain here or just it may have taken a fall at some point. You start pulling on the neck to take it out. This half stays in the guitar, this half breaks free. Um, there's also a little bit of a lacquer check there as well underneath it, which I don't think goes through. They both have some super glue over top of them. It's proud of the surface. Looking at the face of the heel, what is that? I don't know. Um, it's concerning. It doesn't feel like wood. It feels like plaster or maybe epoxy putty or something. And it's concerning because I don't know what that hides. Uh, we'll try to fill it up a little bit as best we can. I don't think I'm ever going to be able to match this color obviously, but We'll try to make it look a little less glaring. There's another chip on the back of the neck here around the fourth or fifth position that really bugs me too when I run my hand up. So I have to fill that. Uh, back of the guitar, there's some honest belt buckle wear, which is fine. It's what you expect. So if this is the after of the neck reset, I wonder what the before looked like. Now something went wrong along the way, obviously, because this guy here is about 11 64ths, that's almost four and a half millimeters on the base side, and just over 8 64ths on the treble. So that is literally twice as high as I would feel comfortable having it. So we got to take a lot off this. So I can hear someone in the background saying, why don't you just take some off the bridge, lower the saddle, and it'll correct that. Well, in this case, this isn't really a one-piece style of bridge, but it doesn't have the Gibson-style adjustment wheels. It's got an inset bone saddle in it, and uh, this is as low as I would want to take it. The other thing is, if I go too much lower, start to lose brake angle. I like the height here, for tonal reasons and a lot of other reasons. The other thing is we've got a non-adjustable dog ear style P90, and if I take off enough material off this bridge to lower the, the saddle to where it should be, I run the risk of basically banging those strings right into the top of the pole pieces. So I have to be careful with the geometry. It, it basically, this bridge has to stay the height that it is. Uh, so I'm left with the only choice being to do a neck reset. When you get into repairing a repair, there's always fun stuff in store. I don't know what's going on inside there. I will say that it makes some funny snappy, crackly, poppy sounds. If seems like it's loose somewhere inside. Well, now that's interesting. Happy days. I see the head of a quarter-twenty furniture bolt. So this thing has been bolted on somehow. 
that's good. Why is it good? Because that means that in the wor very worst case scenario, I can come along and just cut this off and do the Kung Fu neck reset. Because if it's already been bolted on once, I have no compunction against keeping it as a bolt on, and I'm certainly not going to go to try and restore this as a dovetail style instrument. Just does not make sense. Way too much work. Um, so hopefully this thing is just going to come right off. Right. I don't want the tailpiece flopping around while I'm doing work, so I'm going to take it off. And you should be careful while you're doing this because hopefully there'll be a grounding wire that'll come out somewhere underneath the plate here that'll ground both the tailpiece and the strings. And sometimes it'll pop right down the hole again when the tailpiece comes off. So we should be careful. I see no ground wire. So, something we can add to the list. This is a comically long screw. Okay. Hmm, this is going to be fun. Oh yeah, someone in the comments section asked me recently about pinning an archtop bridge in place. And to be honest, these days I'm usually using a very thin double stick adhesive for this. It's very strong, it doesn't move around, but I can also adjust it later if I have to. To do it with pins, uh, all you do is get yourself a couple of uh, very thin wire brads, cut them off to length, drill a hole on each wing of the bridge, and then sink these in there with some super glue to hold them in place. Find the spot that you've previously marked where your bridge should be so it intonates well. Press down so that there, there are two holes or two little dings in the lacquer, and then drill your corresponding holes for the pins. Now I checked this before I took the strings off, and interestingly it was intonating not so great. So, I mean, that might be a function of the extremely high action, or it could also be that uh, it was originally set for different strings. So that's one of the reasons I like to make it firm but, you know, adjustable with the tape. Because sometimes things move, sometimes things change, and um, but this is a good way to do it as well. Just looking at the pickup here, it says TSB91. Don't know what that is? Maybe we can look that up. Now I don't want to desolder this pickup unless I have to, so I'm just going to wrap it up here with some paper towels and uh, do some tape. I'm just going to put it on the inside in the cavity. Um, hopefully where it'll stay out of the way. It's nice, they've done a little bit of a pigtail here so there's extra wire. If I have to get at that switch I can. It won't be too difficult. But let's just do this for now. There's a bolt head. There are actually two of them in there. They're just standard quarter 20 furniture type bolts. So we'll get in there with the Allen wrench. Let's see if we can find the head. We'll do the top one first. There we go. And this is probably going to take some time because I'm only going to be able to do a quarter of a turn at a time. Um, I should probably come up with some sort of ratcheting system for this. Okay, after the better part of half an hour of twisting and turning inside there with very sore fingers, I managed to get those to come free. And you can see the dovetail pocket there. That's previously been painted over. And on this side, the dovetail heel. Um, you can see originally I think they probably wanted to set the insert nuts to the full depth uh, or flush with the uh, front surface of the dovetail here. Realized that there was not nearly enough support in this area of the heel for that and wisely made the choice to bore deeper and sink them in so that they're in line with the uh, the meat of the heel here. Um, there's a truss rod there. This looks in good shape. Strange blob of glue there. Anyway, something to work with. Remember I taught you guys the formula for neck resets and how much to take off the heel? I've got my stack of feeler gauges here and I'm just going to score a line with my scalpel blade. 
I'm scoring the lacquer on the heels so there'll be less tendency for it to chip out. This neck is made of poplar, which is really kind of the worst. Uh, it's very fibrous and does not like to cut very cleanly. Um, it just kind of scrapes away. Not my favorite neck wood. We'll proceed to sandpaper pulls to refine the fit and the angle. I'm saturating the end grain of the neck here with thin super glue. Hopefully that'll take care of those cracks that we saw on the other side from this side as well and uh, keep things good and tight. I'm just checking the action every once in a while with a ruler across the bridge and the first fret to make sure it's going to be close to what I want it to be. It's hard to convey just how far away those bolt heads are from the entrance here. It's not like working through a standard sound hole. And especially the lower bolt there, in order to get this lined up, I couldn't really use the extended handle. And it was nice in that I could sort of, if I used the standard one, I could turn it all the way around in there. But that also required me to do some pretty dexterous things, and it just took an awful lot of patience. Okay, I put some strings on to see how the action is doing. Um, that's important. You've got to try it out before you finalize things. And i got to say, I'm pretty happy with the way it turned out. Uh, I'm just about where I want it to be, right in the center. It's a little bit uh, low on the treble side and a little bit high on the bass side, by about a 64th of an inch in either case. Um, that's less than half a millimeter. I know I can change that enough with uh, saddle adjustment here. I can shim up on the treble and maybe take a little bit off on the bass and we'll get good action. That's what I wanted. Uh, let me tell you folks, working with that where you have to take off and put on the neck several times with those bolts in the location they are, that's no fun. Yeah, note to self, do not make a guitar this way. That's not, it's not repair friendly. Uh, let's talk about something else here. Uh, this design here, where we've got a floating fingerboard extension. Now, in arch tops, this is a plywood top that's pressed into uh, form. High quality arch top, jazz guitars, L5s, D'Angelico's, whatever. Usually, the um, there is a segment underneath the fingerboard extension here, which contacts the top. It's glued directly to the top and is supported by the neck block underneath. In this case, there is a space. It starts off by about a 60, 16th of an inch or so, and actually mm, sort of falls away to nothing at the end here. Um, I'm not sure if that guitar was always this way or whether that's sort of a relic of the uh, the neck reset it previously had. In either case, that's not a good idea. We have to fill that up because there's an awful lot of tension going on right here on the 14th fret. All that folding force from the string tension wants to bend things and it acts like a teeter-totter, you know, a lever. If there's a gap underneath here, there's the fingerboard extension is eventually going to fall down and it's going to raise the action. So what I'm doing is I'm using some spruce shims here. They're tapered and I'm going to put those into place. They fit snugly and they go in about three quarters of an inch. And um, I'm going to glue those in place with a little bit of epoxy. Um, you know, it's, it's, if this ever has to come undone again, it won't be that difficult to get them out. But we do want to make sure it's secure to both the underside of the fingerboard extension and the top so that that problem we had previously is not going to resurface, we hope. With the strings on, I can tell there's some things we got to do to this nut as well. Several of the strings buzz when open. They play cleanly when I fret them. That means that the slots are too low. But look at this E string here, the top E. A big chunk has broken off along the side here. Um, there's not much I can do to rescue that. So the takeoff point for this string is actually about an eighth of an inch behind where it should be. That'll throw off the intonation quite a bit. Um, given the state of it, I think it's probably time to make a new nut. I made the new nut and I didn't film it this time. You can go back and watch the full half hour video I made of making a nut uh, several months ago if you want to see me do that. And here I'm just gluing in those shims with some epoxy. Be very careful about cutting those right up against the line of the fretboard here. And I'll color those afterwards with some paint and some dye just to make them approximate the body color. Just removing a little bit of material on the base side of the saddle here to improve the action. To take care of that big jagged dent on the back of the neck, I used super glue for a drop fill, then added a little bit of blue paint and added more super glue on top there to level it out with the rest of the surface. Here I'm drilling a hole through the end block in the area where the tailpiece will cover for a grounding wire. Feed that all the way through and pull it out through the pickup cavity hole and I can uh, take out the jack as well, solder on the grounding wire in the place where we normally solder grounding wires. Pull that back out through the hole, shorten it, 
peel off the insulation, put a little crimp in it there, and the tailpiece will then squash that up against the body, making good contact and grounding both the strings and the tailpiece itself. Did a little rudimentary color work here with some transparent blue over top of the patched and filled in hole there. I leveled those areas which I filled with super glue using a razor blade scraper and progressively finer sandpaper. Smoothed that up so that it felt good on the hand. And I think we're going to call that done. It's got good low action, plays nicely. The heel, no that's not the same color. It was never going to be the same color but it is smoother than it was. Doesn't uh, have those great big gashes in it and the stuff on the back of the neck is much smoother and doesn't get in the way of playing. So I'm happy with that. Mm -hmm.